And so if you want to diversify your team, you have to diversify the pipeline. You don't look at it and say, well, we met these four people and there's a woman who's good enough, so let's hire her. You mm -hmm. want to have lots of women in the pipeline, so the best person might very well be one of these women. Mm -hmm. I've become a very big proponent of design thinking and liberating structures. And both of these are approaches to problem solving that actively encourage everybody in the room to participate. And adopting strategies like that in meetings is important too, because sometimes women are quiet, but they might have some really good thoughts. It's better if one if user feedback comes in through fewer platforms. Mm -hmm. Because that way it, you do you can spend less time tracking it down and more time acting on it. <laughs> stay involved with people, um, stay in contact with the developers. Make sure when they make changes, they tell you. And be agnostic to how you get information. If someone wants to sit in a meeting with you, say yes. If someone wants to send you email, say yes. If someone wants to make, say, a Google Doc or some other collaborative source, say yes. Mm -hmm. What's important is that you get your information, and as a tech writer, it should not be your job to care how you get it. Welcome. Our guest today is uh, Ilona Korendajc. Hi, Ilona. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're very happy. And my cohort in talking with you is Adam, my colleague. He's also a technical writer at Pronovix, and he's also involved in the API The Docs Conference series. Some of the recaps that you see are his work. Hi, Adam. Uh, hi, everyone. Ilana, you have like 20 plus years of experience in technical documentation, support, UX design, and you're also an Amazon inclusion engineer. I was uh, reading on your LinkedIn profile that you strive to enable people from all backgrounds and disciplines to be more effective through documentation that is crystal clear, actionable, and inclusive. That is, wow, one hell of a mission. And uh, we are super <laughs> happy to have you here. We would like to walk around the topics of the background and the skills of a technical writer. We are also going to ask you about the Women in APIs initiative. And our chief topic is about uh, inclusion and accessibility in documentation. Cool. Sounds good. A lot of technical writers uh, come from a non-IT academic background, for example, literature, something connected to communication and so on. As you mentioned in the API Days Paris last year, you are a trained chef and mixing the proper and quality ingredients in the right amount to create something that others can consume with joy, we can say just like writing documentation. And you are also a former academic. Uh, what domain knowledge outside of documentation has most surprisingly been to your aid in your work as a documentarian? Interestingly, it's been the visual arts. I started doing encaustic painting a couple of years ago and because I spend a lot of free time using the other side of my brain, it makes me better at my job because it rests the, the technical side. Awesome. And because also if you're painting or you're creating something that's just meant to be beautiful, it helps you to think more about your, not, not literally so, but it kind of helps me think about my language and how this, does this sound nice? If someone's reading it out loud, was it awful? <laughs> Yeah, it's a really interesting approach and very prosperous, I think. Are there some soft or not so soft skills that you think are essential to a tech writer? You need to be really good with people. I have joked that being a technical writer is essentially translating nerd to human. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> what does, it's also kind it's true in a way. You need to be able to talk to all kinds of people at the company, not just people in product or marketing, but also developers who really just want to talk code. And then you need to take all these messages and put them together and produce something that's useful. You need to think about what do, you, what do your users need more than what story does your product team want to tell? Because you can, you can have incredibly accurate documentation, but if it doesn't help anybody solve a problem, then it's not really good. <laughs> yeah. I, I learned a lot about technical documentation from uh, sales pitch techniques, actually. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> um, and do you think, can someone learn the necessary attitude for technical writing or is it just something that, well, comes from within? I think actually both. I think that 
everybody can start somewhere and get better. And if you're starting from zero, you're learning it. And if you're starting from having some skills, you're improving them. And nobody's ever going to be perfect. Yes, makes sense. There's some aspects of it I was born with. When I, when I was a little kid and my family would buy a game, my parents would really actually hand me the instructions to read and tell everybody how to play. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I was born with knowing things about inclusive language and, and, and writing in the present tense and that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's it's more the attitude, really. I don't know. I think being actively empathic is a is a bit of a core skill, and you probably have to go through the phase of understanding what's the difference between sympathy and empathy if you want to be able to properly make people understand something that is hard to explain. That's that's very true, and you also have to be able to take criticism. You have to understand that if somebody edits your document, they're not editing you as a human. You may have said something badly. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. Did you have a face like that? Like, did you actually have to go through that too? Yeah. A long and time ago. A lot of people do. It's, it's a thing with writers, though. We get very caught up in our work, no matter the kind of writing. And you have to separate yourself from your product. Yes. I think working in a team helps a lot with that, like peer editing and, and tag teaming. That, that helps fasten this up to, to let your ego go a bit. And you're, yeah, and there's always going to be that engineer who is such an engineer that he doesn't know how to give kind criticism. And things are just wrong. They're not like, you know, it could be better. <laughs> Which is, um, I think it's a very useful learning curve when somebody's actually willing to give you feedback. That's the biggest advice, they, uh, biggest present they can give you. I think rather so than too. patting and, you on the back, which is good for nothing. And sometimes I've had to bribe people for feedback, like bake cookies. And hey, if you review my duck, you can have these nice warm cookies I made. Not you too. <laughs> this seems to be the ultimate thing. And once also I had a, I had a party, a, an, an editing party, and I made dinner and brought good wine and said that people could come in and eat and drink if they were reviewing my docs while they did so. The old times when this was still legal, right? Yeah, when we could sit in a room together. Wow, remember that? <laughs> <laughs> it's great that at least we can do podcasts. Uh, you're also a mentor at the Women in APIs initiative of the API Days conferences. And the way I understand is that the, the goal of this program is to create the opportunities and to, to, prove the, to provide the encouragement and the coaching for people from all walks of lives, uh, and especially women or pointedly women, to give that little push that is necessary. How did this initiative start and how do you see your contribution to it? It started as conversations at API Days conferences, talking with Uri and Baptiste, like, where are the other women? They were very concerned. They're like, yes, we want more women involved with this. Please help. And Isabel Reza contacted me after Paris last year and said, okay, I'm going to actively work on this. We're putting together a program. Do you want to be involved? I was like, yes, yes, of course. And largely led by Claire Barrett, we started this um Four Steps to Speaking program, which is current, which is about to be rebranded, and I will talk about that in a moment. And it, it's it's a four four part series that encourages women to overcome their own self doubt and be and present at a conference or produce an article because it also includes writing. Um, the rebranding it's going to be called Get Right Get Writing and Get Speaking, and it will have two tracks. And then we'll have an aspect of the new program too called Get Connecting. And we, we're going to be having um, quarterly meetups with not just women, but also male allies for people to just have conversations. The four steps of the program involve three, three structured conversations with a group, working on an idea for a proposal, working on um, improving our LinkedIn profiles, and that kind of stuff. And then the fourth one is a one-to-one -one session with a mentor from somebody who's not the facilitator leader. And we actually encourage people who have gone through the program to become facilitators for future programs. We have a facilitation program too for people who want to learn to do that, where first you co-facilitate and you work with the facilitator, and then you get a group of your own. And 
what, someone in the program has called this a women's empowerment pyramid scheme, but it's very true because we gain a lot of people by someone doing it and telling their friends right. that it's valuable to them. And we've had women in the program from junior engineers to very senior business women, and everybody has something to learn and something to contribute. It's really been great. And I think we're now in 11 countries in every continent. Wow. So how how many mentors or, or coaches do you have actively working now? I think six. We really need more. This is my advertising. If you are interested in becoming a mentor or a coach or signing up for the program, please do so. Go to um, API Days and click under initiatives and then w women in APIs. And all the information is there. And all you have to do to join is get yourself on a mailing list. And then you'll be given lots of information. And you're in for life for the pyramid scheme or is this a tangible... <laughs> tangible way of engaging <laughs> i'm sorry can you repeat that question <laughs> <laughs> once you sign up are you in for life <laughs> in the bio no, you, you actually or, are or... allowed to leave um <laughs> and it, there's no money cost at any point unless you you know pay your phone bill for dialing into the zoom meetings right when somebody's interested either as a participant of, of a program or a mentor is there can you give like some advice on self selection for okay what's your anti level what can you contribute or this is really like one on one conversations and they just contact you it's really one on one but i will say that the self selection should be anybody whose job or company has anything to do with apis and who is interested in either writing or speaking so it's a very low it's a very in that sense low bar to entry we welcome really any everybody we don't care if you're just graduating from school in your first job or if you have 30 years of experience. You might have been an engineer, for example, for a very long time, but not wanted to put yourself out there at conferences. Right. We've actually had business owners who were that way, too. Um, they've been so busy working that they haven't publicized themselves. They haven't spoken or written. Yeah. Well, from my own experience, I think the different shades of self-doubt come in waves by the 10 years normally so whatever you're doubting in your 20s you're going to doubt something else in your 30s and something else in your 40s usually yourself in your 40s so i like guess personal experience you get another round in your 50s where you start to wonder if you're too old <laughs> so this this is evergreen topic why api specifically is that because this is where it comes from or there's something specific about apis that needs to be addressed in the program i think I would, I would say mostly it's because it's where it came from. But the other thing is it just seems to be a very male-dominated area that doesn't need to be. There are really smart women working in this field, but we're mm -hmm. not seeing enough of them at events. Mm -hmm. We've seen some amazing women presenters at API The Docs. Yes. Um, if you could give advice for, for people in decision-making roles for in a company, so I don't mean politics, but in a company, men or women, what should they look for in policies and in practical operations so that women are not unwittingly excluded from an API program of a company? There are two things about it. One is hiring. And for me, hiring is all about the pipeline. If you're actively seeking applications from everywhere, you'll find the best people. Whereas if you're only seeking applications from like say one school or mm -hmm. one organization, mm -hmm. you're, you, you will get good people, but you're not going to have as broad a selection. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you want to diversify your team, you have to diversify the pipeline. You don't look at it and say, well, we met these four people and there's a woman who's good enough, so let's hire her. You mm -hmm. want to have lots of women in the pipeline, so the best person might very well be one of these women. Mm -hmm. I've become a very big proponent of design thinking and liberating structures. And both of these are approaches to problem solving that actively encourage everybody in the room to participate and adopting strategies like that in meetings. It's important too, because sometimes women are quiet, but they might have some really good thoughts. Right. Yes. Like for instance, I, I have seen that as a, as a mediator of meetups. Uh, or a facilitator of meetups that um, even if someone knows exactly what they would like to say, that the tiny little bit of just holding the space that that matters a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's really it's really important. And as a leader, have an open door because you might have that person on your team who has a really good idea, but they're shy and they might come to you afterwards and, and add mm -hmm. things. 
Mm -hmm. And just always say at the end of meetings, you know, if you have something you wanted to add and didn't have a chance to talk, please email me, please Slack me, please stop by. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I also prefer all the public channels rather than than personal communications, even though like for shy shy people, this could seem frightening. But then a lot of incredibly valuable contributions may happen in private channels and they're never acknowledged. And I, I agree. Um, sometimes if someone get, has a really good idea in a private channel, I will say to them, hey, can I put, can we, go post this in the main channel? Yes. Or is it okay if I share this broader? And then I will say, you know, this person had this great idea. Let's, let's, I'd like to talk more about it. Yeah. You just have to make sure if you're doing that, you're giving credit to the right people. Exactly. Or, just f- keeping the flow of people observing what is actually happening in reality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Laura mentioned that you are an Amazon inclusion engineer, and I don't know how many of us are familiar with the term in- in- inclusivity when it comes to technical documentation. So, I, uh, before uh, asking any questions, I would like to well uh, quote a definition. I copied it from one of your presentations. So <laughs> <laughs> an inclusive workspace values and provides equal opportunities for all employees, regardless of differences, to achieve their maximum potential of work without discrimination, which means inclusion is a practice or policy of including people who might otherwise be excluded, excluded or marginalized, uh, which means Inclusion leads to belonging, which is a drive to form lasting, positive, and significant relationships with others. Uh, And ultimately, inclusion and belonging lead to psychological safety. Neuro and cognitive diversity exists across all educational, disability, age, and so on groups. Uh, What are the key limitations uh, we should always consider in documentation and UI or UX design? Okay, that's a that's a very broad, broadly staged question. You have to remember that not everybody using your documentation can read and can click a mouse for like two really basic things. You want, you have, so accessibility, basic things like accessibility, always write so that it can be read by a screen reader. Always have keyboard only options. Any picture should needs to have alt text that explains what the picture is. And don't present new information in a in a picture. Use pictures to illustrate what you've already said. And, and and it's kind of thing that could be really basic. And another really basic thing is don't assume the gender of your user. You, you know, don't say he or she. Just say you. If you write in the second person, it, in, we're talking about English here. It becomes very easy and elegant. And if you have, to, and you can use the singular they. And people think that's really awkward, but it actually predates Shakespeare. Like using they is singular. <laughs> it's very I, I think that would come almost more naturally to native speakers, like the foreign speakers who learn the dogma of they is for them, for multiple other people. That's very, very sounds really, really, really weird. No, actually, native speakers also learn that too. So it's relearning. Yeah. Okay. And... Specifically in API documentation, do you see something that we do because because this is how it evolved, that is actually going against accessibility? I think there are aspects of the open API spec when it comes to documentation, it's very mouse centric. Mm-hmm. You have to be really careful when you take that and you've developed the CSS for your website to work around that and enable keyboard mm-hmm. use. Mm-hmm. That's that's the biggest thing I can think of off the top of my head, because API documentation tends to be very code focused and less about people. A lot of the stuff becomes not an issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's really more about website accessibility at this at that point. Mm-hmm. And that's very well documented. Um, you can read lots of stuff online about it. And there's also something I recommend often called the conscious style guide which basically has um, inclusivity and accessibility for anything you could ever think of all like gathered together in, in one website to help you find it. The conscious style guide. Yes. Another thing that's really well documented, so I won't spend time explaining it, but international English or standard yes. English. Yes. 
because that's what somebody in another country is more likely to be able to read and process well. And if you send that to the translator, they will have an easy, easier time translating. Yes. What sort of immersive experience a technical writer would need to then make this visceral connection with being accessible? You want your documentation to not rely on line breaks for 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 information. And by the way, this also goes back to applying to screen readers. White space is nice for people who see it, but that shouldn't be a method of dividing your information. Because in a different language, the white space is going to be somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't use hard returns, for example, in the middle of sentences or paragraphs to, to for breaks. Use actual punctuation. So that's something to keep in mind. Like layout things are really important. Awesome. I guess working with forms, like templates for, for returning things are really helping with onboarding your new colleagues who may theoretically know this, but not practically apply it when they are in a heated situation. And if you don't have templates, at least you should have a style guide where you write down, you know, there's a million things you can do. And then write down the ones that are priority and put it on your wiki or wherever so that everyone can always refer to it. And the nifty thing is, if you're the tech writer and you're worried about inclusion and accessibility, you can then say to other teams that produce stuff like marketing, hey, I put together this thing and I encourage you to use it and add what your team needs to it. And eventually your company is going to have a really robust style guide. Were we involved in the creation of such? I, I have been actually at several companies I've worked at because it's and- something that's really important to me. So I always volunteer. Do you have like advice, like marketing? Is that the, the key entry entry point to spread it? When you think about who produces the most documentation that is seen outside your company, it's probably tech writers and marketing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would say, why not start there? Mm-hmm. Then get your social media team. They probably have useful things to add that you haven't thought of. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, legal. And anybody that faces outside is going to have different concerns. Do you want to, if you want to have a really robust style guide for your whole company, include everyone who produces written documents. Right. And uh, when it comes to API documentation, uh, do you see new best practices uh, that maybe can change current professional standards? I do, but it's all more related to web design than documentation. Mm-hmm. Like, like, like I said before, I think most companies' API docs could produce a better experience for people with with different physical limitations. And by the way, for example, a problem reading might just be that you broke your glasses. Right. Or a, or a problem using the mouse may be that like you had tendonitis surgery. It doesn't have to always be something permanent. Yep. So if you look at it that way too, it you can see in some ways how it's even more important. Or it might be easier to relate to. I think to create um, a quality and user, usable documentation, getting feedback from the communities is also essential. How can someone can create uh, technical frameworks that allow feedback options uh, for different audiences? There's different ways you can do that. Make yourself available. You know, if you don't want to give out your personal email address, create like docs at for your companies that people can send feedback to. If you have a, if you have Slack channel, then this is, you know, advantages that come from being in developer relations. If you have Slack channels where you're working with users, say, make sure to always say, Hey, I've got new documentation on this. Can you, I'd love feedback. You know, they're the users that are going to like be reading your change log and be looking right away to see what's new. So work with them and make them feel included and they'll be and take and take their feedback and, and act on it and they'll be more inclined to give you more feedback later what's your experience what is because so on the one hand you want actionable feedback and you probably have an idea of what are the points you're not sure about on the other hand if you're very very specific in your request you may not get answers I would, I, would be, I would be more open I would say like here at this URL, there's new docs. Let me know what you think. Mm -hmm. So you don't specify about what? No, I I tend not to because I feel that if I just ask a broader question that I will be more likely to get any answer and broader answers, you can always weed out the stuff that's not helpful. Did, Did you, so 
you know, there's this that is like, don't don't ask the question if you don't want to have the answer. So what if you're I'll really start. successful and, and people are very happy to give you uh, two metric tons of feedback? What then? Sort through it like you would with any other feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, what's important to do now, what you might want to do later and what's not useful at all. Mm -hmm. The same thing you would do with internal feedback before you published it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes a bug slips by everybody inside, but someone outside was like, wait a minute, I tried to do this and it didn't work. Do people that's, expect an that's answer? That's a critical bug. <laughs> do people expect an answer? Say you sort through, you take the actionable, immediately necessary parts, and then there's feedback that gets into a log somewhere, mm, feedback you didn't act on. So do you? is there a best practice like should we always react on feedback or should we not? I, I think it's a good idea. If you want people to keep giving it to you, you should react on it. Maybe you can open up part of your JIRA for external people that so they can use it and they can track their, their, their requests. Mm -hmm. Or you could use a product like User Voice that's directly open to the public. And then you look through it and put into JIRA the ones you're going to use. But you respond in a public forum and say, you know, in process, investigating, closed. Mm -hmm. Decline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, so yeah, if you want to help you respond to their offer, even if the answer is no, and if the answer is no, tell them why. Right, or even at least an offer a workaround or something. Yeah. Well, that's they might, ask, you just might ask for something that's not doable or that is actually inaccurate, mm -hmm. <laughs> or that your company doesn't do. For example, if your company only produces sample code in JSON and someone gives you feedback that they want it in another language, the answer may be no. And just say, at this point, we don't have enough people working on it to give you that. Would this be something that needs like a dedicated code on a tech writer spending time on this? Just like, for instance, a developer yeah. would say, I'm, I'm fine writing documentation, but I want that to acknowledge the time that I'm spending on that. And, and that's necessary because otherwise it looks like I'm not working that much. Does the tech writer also need that? acknowledgement for de dealing with feedback like one few tech writers a lot of feedback that can in a lot well, of I, I think so yes because i think addressing feedback is part of the job and if one say one person on the team their job is i'm the person who interfaces with the public and sorts through the feedback that should be part of their objectives they should get credit for doing this because it's not easy yes and, and it's also a job that should be done by volunteer because some tech writers like to like to interface with the public and some don't, just like anybody else. Exactly. Do you have uh, suggestions for metrics to follow this? I think that I don't have detailed metrics, but I think that the metric should be something on a service level agreement equivalent kind of thing. Like all feedback should be responded to within a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. And responding might just mean you filed the bug, not that you acted on it. Mm -hmm. But I do not have, I have not yet developed good metrics for the amount of time. Mm -hmm. How can you keep documentation up to date if you have to address a rich variety of users? Because uh, the COVID situation forced many people to work from a home office. They encounter new tools and they have to learn how to use them. So. I think you just kind of have to do it. Um, just stay in contact with people like you would if you were in the office. Nobody likes meetings and people like them even less online. So use Slack more. Mm -hmm. It's it's immediate. It's more it's more useful than email for that reason. But stay involved with people. Um, stay in contact with the developers. Make sure when they make changes, they tell you. And be agnostic to how you get information. If someone okay. wants to sit in a meeting with you, say yes. If someone wants to send you email, say yes. If someone wants to make, say, a Google Doc or some other collaborative source, say yes. Mm -hmm. What's important is that you get your information. And as a tech writer, it should not be your job to care how you get it. Make it easy for the people work that are helping you. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a lot of uh, communication tools from Slack to email and other other uh, platforms so do you think it's better to have if you provide multiple platforms for user feedback uh, instead of one consistent or dedicated platform 
in that case, I'm going to change my mind and say no, <laughs> because it, you want to be able to coordinate that more, more easily. Um, I think the people you work with on a day-to-day basis, you want more, but you just want, it's better if one, if user feedback comes in through fewer platforms, because mm-hmm. that way it, you do, you can spend less time tracking it down and more time acting on it. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a central place for triage and then execute. Yeah, and if you're at a company that can have user forums and people are helping each other, sometimes you might learn something that you want to put in the doc instead of just keeping there. So it's it's worth checking, the if you have them, it's worth checking the user forums regularly too. And so, oh yeah, I should mention support team. The support team is really your ally. If they get asked a question often, I would take that as a sign that the documentation should be improved. I wonder, were you in a situation where the technical writer team could reuse the system the support team already has for receiving feedback and for for logging feedback? Only once, because at one company, I was on the support team as documentation manager. Mm -hmm. And so I absolutely built our knowledge base so that I went through it every quarter and took out private information about users and turned those into help, um, knowledge base articles. Mm-hmm. So it was it was very well connected. It was really great. It saved everybody a lot of times because I had the support team helping write helping write from that standpoint. Mm-hmm. And then I was opening it up to users who might have the same question. Mm-hmm. Because another thing about more technical users is they don't want to read stuff. They just want to like search for an answer, get it, and act on it. Yeah. A knowledge base was a really good format for them. Yeah. I I think I have yet to come across an FAQ that actually gave me the answer. No, exact example. And I actually, I actually really avoid the term FAQ unless it's, unless it's real and, you know, done by a- analytics. I will just, you know, because most companies use it as a place to dump facts. I didn't know where else to put them. <laughs> <laughs> Incubation space. And I don't have a good good idea f- exactly for what you should call it, but I do think that frequently asked questions should be things that actually are frequently asked. Yeah, if it's frequently asked, it shouldn't be a question anymore, right? It's so frequently asked. But yeah, I don't I don't like FAQs that are catch alls for stuff we didn't know where else to put, so we're putting here. Maybe it's the the questions we really don't think you would ask, but here this here's the answer. <laughs> Or just, you know, yeah, just, or just call it questions, Q&A instead of FAQ. Yeah. (laughs) Is there a conclusion that you would like to leave our listeners with? Well, all the listeners know this, but documentation is really important. And write your documentation to solve user problems, not tell product stories. That, that's that's the big one. That's the big thing for me. Mm-hmm. Write it with your, always write documentation with your users in mind. What do they need to do and how can I help them do it? Thank you for your advice and your time. Thank you. And this was our API to Docs podcast with Ilona Kor and Deitch. If people would like to reach you, where can they contact you? You can email me at ilona at ikd.io. And if it's about the Women in APIs initiative? You can also, women in APIs at API days. I think it's .co or is .com. I was wondering, I thought I was not seeing properly, but I also saw co.co. I think it's, yeah, I think it's women in APIs at API days.co. Mm-hmm. And that goes to a group of people and someone will answer you. Okay. Thank you, Ilona. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. You can reach us at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidedocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past presentations from the API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.